Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to London Lopate at Large. I'm London Lopate. There have been many instances throughout history where people have warned about an impending disaster and unfortunately were ignored. How can we know when to heed their warnings? Richard A. Clark and R.P. Eddy have written a book that attempts to answer that question by proposing a method for distinguishing between real serious threats and imagined or overblown ones, and they do it through invoking the story of Cassandra, the princess of Troy, who was blessed with supernatural foresight, but cursed because no one would believe her. Richard Clark and R.P. Eddy are both veterans of the White House Security Council and currently CEOs of cybersecurity firms. Their book, Warnings, Finding Cassandra's to Stop Catastrophes, is now available in paperback from Echo Press, and I'm very pleased that it brings Richard Clark to our show now. Hello. Hey, good afternoon. How are you? I'm well, uh, and I hope you are too, although <laughs> there's a lot to be worried about. <laughs> Uh, and we'll address some of those things as we continue this conversation. You discuss a number of case studies from both the past and present. What are some of the past catastrophes that uh, we should be most concerned about? Well, the past catastrophes that we looked at in the book range uh, from the the best-known story, uh, which was the space shuttle disaster, uh, where an engineer, an expert uh, with data, uh, said you can't launch the, the shuttle under these circumstances or it'll blow up, uh, and they overrode him. Uh, and, uh, of course, it blew up and all the, the astronauts died. Uh, so we go from that uh, to um, the 2008 uh, Great Recession. Uh, we talk about things like the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster, uh, the dikes failing in New Orleans after the Katrina hurricane. Uh, there are actually endless examples. Bernie Madoff, the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, right. Yeah, a whole bunch uh, of The things. rise of ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria. We could have written a 50-volume you know, book uh, of past disasters um, where an expert, and this is the difference between a Cassandra and a, and a, a boy who cried wolf, um, a Cassandra uh, said what was going to happen. A Cassandra in our book is an expert uh, who has um, data. They're data-driven. They've looked for, they've sought out peer review, uh, and no one uh, was really able to shoot down their analysis during that peer review. Uh, and uh, for some reason, they're ignored. And we go through in the book about a dozen reasons why uh, people tend to ignore them. Uh, But the overpowering, overpowerful one um, is what we call first occurrence syndrome. Uh, And Hillary Clinton picked this up uh, in her last book, What Happened. Uh, She said, after the election, she was reading our book uh, and saw this thing about first occurrence syndrome, which is, when you're presented with the evidence by experts uh, and you say, yeah, well, maybe it'll happen, but I don't think so, and even if it does, it won't be that bad. It won't be as bad as you predict because they have a cognitive bias derived from the fact that they've never seen something like this happen before. And you cite the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, where the Cassandra was a respected U.S. intelligence operative who was empowered to send an official warning of war directly to President Bush's fax machine. Uh, It was ignored. Uh, You say the assumption, uh, this initial occurrence syndrome, the assumption is that if, I'm quoting, if a phenomenon had never happened before, it never would, an analyst argued, no Arab nation has ever gone to war with another Arab nation or invaded a brother Arab's territory. Well, of course, there's always a first time. See, logically, you know there's always a first time. Uh, But we're dealing with probabilities. Uh, 
Uh, and so when the analyst said, and I was in the room, uh, when the analyst said, ah, that's a very low probability because no one, you know, there's kind of a tradition here and there's kind of a cultural thing you don't understand. Um, and that is that Arabs don't invade Arabs. Well, until they do, right? And now we have uh, Yemen, and, and for that's example. that's the problem with all of this. The thing that Hillary Clinton ran up against uh, with the so-called Steele dossier and the other information about Russian activity that the U.S. government had independent of Steele uh, was the U.S. government analysts and U.S. government leaders uh, <clears throat> knew something was happening. They just didn't take it seriously. They didn't think it would have a big effect because they'd never seen anything like it happen before. And you say that uh, this is uh, a special case of availability bias, uh, one that's more difficult to overcome because of the complete lack of precedent that would allow our brains to estimate the likelihood of such an event occurring. Yeah, if you if you don't have actuarial data of a kind, you know, uh, the thing about actuarial data is uh, we can tell through uh, years of driving records of millions of people uh, the probability that you, if you're a uh, 50-year-old white male living in New York and driving a Subaru, uh, we can pretty well say what the probability is that you're going to have an accident. Uh, and that has very high confidence. That has like 99% confidence. But when you're talking about uh, actuarial data, past precedent of Russians trying to interfere in the U.S. election, there isn't any. Cassandra has become a useful label for anyone who correctly predicts disaster but is tragically ignored. That's in contrast with Chicken Littles, the people who raise alarms needlessly. So is one of your goals with this book uh, to help us to, to be able to tell the difference? Yeah, we have a, a sort of pseudo-social science uh, methodology and, uh, and matrix uh, where you get to ask a lot of questions. Um, about the source, uh, the predictor, um, the person who's predicting the, the disaster. You get to ask a lot of questions about the disaster itself. You get to ask a lot of questions about the audience, the decision maker. Uh, and you put all these together, uh, and we think you can score on a relatively straightforward, you know, one to ten kind of score what the potential is that you're looking at um, a, cata uh, a catastrophe that w we would call a Cassandra event, where it was predicted in advance uh, and it did happen as predicted, and people did little or nothing about it. Sometimes they do a little. You know, they hedge their bets a little uh, so they can say, well, you know, we were on it, we did little. Um, but more often than not, they just ignore it. Can you give us an example of a chicken little Event. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in the book, we talk about something um, that Gerald Ford did when he, when he was president. Shortly after he became president, people came to him and said, "You know, there's a real potential for a devastating flu, and it could be as bad as the Spanish flu of 1919 that killed millions of people, not just in Spain but throughout the world." And you have to get the drug makers to do a vaccine really fast. And then you have to get everybody in the country to take it. Well, the drug maker said, we can't do the drug trials that fast. Uh, and we don't want to do it because people will get sick uh, if we do it wrong. Uh, and we'll get sued. So Ford went to the Congress uh, and waived all of that, got them protection uh, so they couldn't be sued, uh, got federal government money to drive the vaccine production. And they started giving people the vaccine, and it did make some people sick. Uh, and then the flu never happened. It never materialized. Uh, so we go back and we look at why was the prediction wrong? Well, the prediction really wasn't by epidemiologists. Uh, it was by people in the health department, federal health department. Uh, but the epidemiologists were never saying, uh, the real experts were never saying, what their bosses three levels up said to the president. On the other hand, if it had happened and we hadn't been prepared, then it would have been in the other part of your book. Right. So 
what we say is here's a perfect case of where you do a hedging strategy, where you develop the vaccine, uh, but you don't give it out uh, until the flu begins to materialize. We talk a lot about responses to Cassandra's. You know, so part of the book is how do you identify a Cassandra? The other part of the book is what do you do when a Cassandra says something and you're the guy or the gal in charge? And what we talk about are hedging strategies that do constant monitoring so that you can tell when the evidence is getting higher, uh, when it begins to get more convincing, uh, then you can do more to get ready. Uh, or do something that would prevent it. Uh, but usually, if, if an event is going to happen, uh, you can say, okay, if that event's going to happen, between now and then we're going to see the following indicators that will tell us, yeah, we're on that path. Uh, and you can set up trip lines uh, and then commit resources uh, as those trip lines are met. You've written about these missed warnings like thrillers with a frustrated hero trying to get the world to see what's about to happen. Yeah, every, every chapter is about a person, and we try to make that person come – it's a real person. We try to make that person come alive. Uh, and you know, the fascinating thing is they all say the same thing. Uh, they're all in different fields, economics, intelligence, engineering, uh, and yet they all use the same phrases with us. Um, I, I wish I w- were wrong. I asked my colleagues what's wrong with this uh, data. No one could tell me. Uh, I was going crazy as it, as it approached, and I knew it was going to happen. It, it sounds like you're interviewing the same person over and over again. Do they also say, I told you so? Not so much. And the other thing is... But they the, must have the, felt real the, frustration. They never get much credit after the fact. You know, not, not a lot of people come around and say, oh my God, you were right, we should have listened to you. I'm speaking to Richard Clark, who uh, has written with R.P. Eddy, Warnings, Finding Cassandra's to Stop Catastrophes. It's now available in paperback from Echo. Uh, you've written a number of books in the past by yourself. Why did you decide to collaborate on this one? Well, the, the origin of this book was my friend uh, R.P. and I were sitting around, um, as we often do, uh, over a bottle of scotch. Uh, and we said to each other, you know, Jeff, did you ever know this, this phenomenon? Uh, and we don't really remember who said that, but one of us said that, and the other one said, yeah, I've been wondering about that for years. And we kind of bet each other that it was a phenomenon. So we said, all right, we've got to look into this. We've got to, let's just take a list of a dozen disasters that have happened. Uh, let's go back in history, uh, in recent history, uh, and see if there were Cassandras. And we went back, and in every case, we found one. And we said, all right, we've got to write this book, and we've got to write it together. Don't you know about this from personal experience as one of a few experts who warned officials about an imminent attack on American soil by Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda? Yeah, but I don't get I don't get into that uh, in the book. I, uh, you know, a lot of people want to be um, say I'm a Cassandra, and you know, but you I, I have written a book about 9/11 and what I said beforehand. I didn't need to do that again. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I've. I feel a lot of sympathy for the characters, the true-life characters in the book, because, yeah, I have kind of gone through the same situation. Why didn't anyone in the highest levels of the George W. Bush administration believe you? Well, again, it's one of these cases where um, it's never happened before. Um, I was saying there's a real probability that uh, this non-state actor uh, will be capable of doing uh, nation-state-like uh, level attack, uh, and it's possible that that attack will be in the United States. Uh, that, none of that had ever happened before. We hadn't had an attack in the United States by uh, foreign enemies since Pearl Harbor. Well, there had been that explosion uh, and, in the World you know, Trade that Center. A, that was a nation-state. We did have that Which explosion. people also had their own agenda. They had other issues on their mind. That's one of the phenomenon we find in the book with all of the decision makers. All of the decision makers have their own agenda. That's natural. You make someone the president of a university or the CEO of a company, 
they're automatically going to walk in on day one with an agenda, or they'll have developed one by the end of the first month. And they don't want some guy with his hair on fire to come into the room and say, drop everything you're doing. My issue is more important. And in this case, the obsession was with Iraq? It was with Iraq, yeah. And they also had uh, an agenda about relations with Russia uh, and relations with China. Is it fair to say that we are quite good at setting up systems for analyzing potential disasters, but terrible at utilizing those systems when it may count? I'm not even sure we're good at having systems to see these uh, <clears throat> black swan events or Cassandra events. Um, I think they kind of fall through the cracks oftentimes. Um, you know, take, for example, one of the things we write about in the book is sea level rise. Uh, I think when we first looked at this, um, people didn't really, they weren't too sure that sea level rise was happening as rapidly as it, as it now appears to be. But we had a Cassandra, Jim uh, Hansen at Columbia, uh, who said, no, it's really happening much faster than anyone else believes. Well, who in the U.S. government is in charge of sea level rise? Uh, oftentimes these problems are new issues that fall between the cracks. And again, one of the things we see in analyzing all these cases is the decision maker is not always evident. And people can get off the hook by saying, well, that's not my job. Well, in the case of sea level rise, it all is connected to the issue of climate change and, and global warning warming. Uh, and uh, I wonder whether there isn't uh, often a, a political or a, uh, or a corporate co reason for rejecting these ideas. Almost always. Uh, almost always there's a political or, or uh, budgetary or corporate uh, philosophy. <clears throat> so a lot of the problems uh, that we write about in the book require big government solutions require government regulation, government intervention, government spending. And uh, you've got one political party in this country that thinks regulation is a, is a four-letter word uh, and wouldn't regulate anything if their life depended on it or if their country or if the planet depended on it. And expense is often cited, as we're seeing right now with the Khashoggi uh, situation, uh, Money, yeah, well, money's a factor. I think expense is usually uh, one of the big reasons people don't act. Um, but it turns out that the cost of acting in advance of a disaster is almost always a tiny fraction of the cost of acting after the disaster. You mentioned uh, New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina. A little over a year before Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, FEMA con conducted a, a simulation of a similar hurricane that predicted catastrophic damage and death, but nothing was done to strengthen the, the aging levees or prepare the city. Was that all about money? Yeah, uh, largely it was about money. We have in the book a Cassandra who was a professor at Louisiana State uh, and who had done an analysis uh, of the dams and dikes and said, these things aren't going to hold in a Category 4 or Category 5 hurricane. They'll be overtopped, and the city will flood. And, <clears throat> you know, like most of our Cassandras, when they throw out these warnings and nothing happens, they get excited uh, and try to make noise and try to get attention. Uh, and so this guy was fired from his job as a, as a professor at LSU, because he was a pain in the ass for all of these people who didn't want to hear it. Uh, that has happened in a number of cases. People have been ridiculed uh, either by uh, the, their superiors or in the press uh, when they've come up with perfectly good ideas because we just don't want to hear what ha they have to say or because it yeah, goes... And it, it's absurd, uh, but there is a tendency to say, oh, you're a troublemaker uh, and you're... Um, you know, you're not on our, sh our sheet music. When Hansen uh, was working in the government, uh, they tried to silence him. Wasn't he at uh, NASA? Very often. Uh, the Bush administration tried to silence him. Uh, both Bush administrations. Uh, and he, to his enormous credit, uh, wouldn't be silenced. 
uh, and you found a congressional ally or two uh, to protect him. On the other hand, we are still arguing over that, and we still have people saying that global warming is a hoax. There, there have been two extremely destructive hurricanes in just recent weeks. Has the federal state, uh, have the the federal state and local government agencies learned anything from Katrina? Well, I, I, look at the expert level. Uh, everybody knows uh, that global warming and sea level rise are a real thing. Uh, mayors in places like Norfolk, Virginia, and Miami Beach uh, are, are having to deal with it already. Uh, but there are moneyed interests that want to prevent uh, the realization of how bad the problem is. Uh, take a look at Miami Beach. People are still building expensive high-rise condominiums. Uh, there are companies that have enormous financial interests uh, in those developments, and then there are insurance companies that have enormous interest in insuring them. Uh, and if we were to tell the truth uh, that those buildings won't be around in 30 years or they won't be usable in 30 years, uh, people could go bankrupt. The Governor Rick Scott of Florida uh, is reported to have uh, excised the words climate change from uh, the websites of most of the state's agencies. Uh, I don't know if anybody's challenged him on that in, in the wake of what has just happened uh, with Hurricane Michael, but um, what have the people who have rejected all of these warnings done on the whole? Have they just shrugged and said, oops, that's life? Yeah, well, usually they say no one could ever have predicted that. Um, Condi Rice, for example, after 9-11, uh, when she was forced finally to testify before the 9-11 Commission, uh, said, well, no one could have predicted that. Uh, and that, that's a phrase we found a lot, uh, where people say, yeah, well, uh, you can't possibly hold me accountable because uh, that had never happened before, and no one could have expected that. Uh, and sometimes that people don't remember uh, that, yes, in fact, it was predicted, and you had the prediction on your desk. You think they don't remember or they don't want to remember because uh, it makes them look bad? Well, they remember, but the, the, the frequently the legislature, the media, uh, the constituencies uh, don't remember or don't want to. Some of the other disasters you write about, uh, you mentioned earlier, Fukushima's a nuclear disaster, Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme, a mine collapse in West Virginia, and uh, the 2008 recession. Yeah, they were all predicted uh, and predicted by experts. And these are not experts who just woke up on the wrong side of the bed and, or people who had a, you know, a, a sudden thought. These are people who were crunching numbers, uh, running data uh, in all cases, and the data turned out to be frightening, and then they'd run the data again, uh, and they'd act, uh, ask other experts to look at it. Uh, that's the pattern in all of these cases. Uh, and it's the pattern now that we see with things like sea level rise. Uh, it's the pattern that we see now, um, we think, uh, with things like uh, gene editing, uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, with new technologies coming along that could be really very helpful for the world, but could also, if put in the wrong hands, be very damaging. A number of experts are predicting another financial collapse, despite uh, what we're supposed to have learned from the collapse of 2008. Well, yeah. Uh, and, you know, the truth is that there are, in the financial world, there are always some experts predicting it, um, which it makes the financial world a little bit different than the other fields that we looked at. Um, but I think you have to, when you get predictions like that, uh, and they're data-driven, uh, you have to analyze them. You know, when I was in the White House, I was always being given conspiracy theories about this or that that sounded crazy, and nine out of ten of them were. But I said, look, it's our job uh, not just to scoff, but to run them to ground, to, uh, to negate them, uh, you know, to prove that they're wrong. Uh, 
Uh, and I think in the case of financial analysis, uh, that has to be done, too. Were the conspiracy theories that didn't pan out based on any real evidence? Uh, they were based on what people thought was evidence. And then when you looked at the evidence, it fell apart. When uh, Cassandra saw through Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme long before it collapsed, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission officials couldn't understand the financial details of the information that he presented to them. That's kind yeah, of that's embarrassing. Yeah, that's the case, that the people, you know, the first question when you're Cassandra is, who do I bring my results to? Uh, and that's not always obvious. In the case of Bernie Madoff, he brought them to the uh, SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, and the people there were lawyers, uh, and he was giving them regression analysis and mathematical uh, analysis, uh, and they actually really didn't understand what he was talking about. And but you what they should have done, of course, was say, okay, this isn't our field. Let's go get some other experts who, uh, who will understand the math uh, and see if you're right. Uh, and he did this, I think, three years in a row, uh, and they never did anything. You call this complexity mismatch. Uh, so, uh, I'm quoting. Yeah, some, when, some decision when problems ma- are uh, too complex for any uh, one expert field to deal with, uh, and climate change is an example of that. Um, artificial intelligence may be an example of that, uh, where the problem just gets so complex that any one expert, or maybe even any one field of expertise, uh, isn't enough to understand what's going on. And you're right, some decision makers are uncomfortable with the warning, in part because of its complexity and also because their lack of expertise may highlight their own inadequacies and make them dependent upon someone whose skills they can't easily judge or who is uh, below them on, on the, uh, the totem pole. That happens all the time. Uh, you know, policymakers uh, in most uh, legislatures and most governments are lawyers. Uh, and, you know, you can love lawyers or hate lawyers, but you have to admit that most of them became lawyers because, well, they weren't good at math and science. And you then bring to a policymaker who's a lawyer uh, a complex problem like, um, well, cybersecurity. Uh, and they really have no idea what you're talking about. And they'd rather you go away because they don't want to take the time to learn about it. Uh, they're not even sure that they could uh, and they don't really want to rely on people not like them. I'm speaking with Richard Clark, who is co-author uh, with uh, uh, what uh, R.P. Eddy of a book called Warnings, Finding Cassandra's to Stop Catastrophes, now available in paperback from Echo, that's a gospel song, but it seemed to me totally appropriate <laughs> to what we're discussing. Uh, the, the recent report from the United Nations Scientific Panel on Climate Change, uh, which was released just a couple of weeks ago, predicts seriously immediate consequences of climate change. Why are so many people in American politics and industry rejecting it? Is it simply a matter of expedience? Well, I'm not even sure a lot of people in the industry are. I think a lot of people in the in the corporate world are planning for it. Um, but if you if you look at who's saying no, it's not true. Uh, and frankly, they're largely Republicans uh, and politicians, and they don't want to face the things that we would have to do if it were true. They would have to be big government solutions, and they would have to be more regulation. We would have to spend money, uh, which would mean that we'd have to raise taxes. I mean, if you think about the 50-year horizon, just on sea level rise alone, we may have to move tens, scores of millions of Americans uh, and and move cities and build new ones. Uh, that's an incredible government program. Uh, and if you're a uh, hater of big government, uh, you don't want to have to admit that's necessary.
I recently spoke about uh, a series of films with scientists who work in, uh, in environmental science, and most of them have been receiving angry mail, in some cases death threats, uh, because they're, they're doing basic science, but basic science that uh, some people just don't like them to be doing. So th- there's another component here as well. Uh, well, the president, uh, I think last week, uh, in his interview with Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes, said, oh, yeah, the scientists, they have a political agenda. They do? Really? What's the political agenda? Do, do scientists want uh, the federal government to regulate things for political reasons? Do they want taxes to go up for political reasons? Do they want government planning uh, to deal with this crisis that's about to happen for political reasons? I, I don't think so. I think scientists are just simply reporting what their, what their science, what their analysis shows. Well, the critics say that it's all about funding. They want more funding for their work. Well, that's absurd. I mean, the, the notion that uh, the scientists are going to predict uh, that American cities are going to be flooded so that they can get more money to study it. Um, that, you'd only say that if you'd never met any of these scientists. You also examine the rise of ISIS. Who was the Cassandra there? Well, the Cassandra there was a, an American expert, a uh, foreign service officer who had spent his entire life in the Arab world. Uh, and it was appointed our, as a, our ambassador to uh, Syria before it all broke apart. Uh, And he said, there's going to be a big civil war here, and if we we don't take sides uh, against the present government, against President Assad, um, then the war will drag out for a long time, and it will give a fertile ground for a new terrorist group to rise up. And that terrorist group will rise up on both sides of the border, uh, in Iraq and Syria, and we will be big enough to take cities and rule a big amount of countryside. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Well, isn't he the kind of expert we usually rely on for that kind of information? After all, he had plenty of professional experience. Uh, and uh, in this case, he's looking at uh, the Nusra Front uh, and, and suggesting that they'll step in to a leadership role uh, among the opposition factions in Syria. Um, how was that responded to in government and in the media? Well, it's interesting. Um, he made that uh, analysis for the Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton, who said, oh, yeah, I see that. You're right. Uh, and she took it to the Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, who said, yes, you're right. Uh, and they took it to President Obama. And here we get, um, you know, this phenomenon is neither right nor left. It occurs on both sides. Here we get a case of political filter and political ideology uh, on, the, on the left. Uh, President Obama's political filter and political ideology was he didn't want to get us involved further uh, in the Middle East uh, in terms of civil wars and uh, uh, intelligence operations. Uh, he thought we we messed that up so much in the past that we weren't very good at it. We should just not get involved. Uh, and so that filter was strong enough that it overcame the recommendations of his Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense that he should do something. In January 2014, President Obama referred to ISIS as the JV team of terrorists. Yeah, and you know, to be fair to Obama, he... He did kind of what we were suggesting in the book in terms of saying, well, I'll hedge a little, Uh, you know, I'll do a little, and I'll put it under monitoring, and if the evidence continues to come in that you're right, I'll do more. He he said all that, he did all that, but when the evidence came in, he didn't do more. And has he ever explained why? Yeah, I mean, basically what I just said, he, he said, you know, he was reluctant to get us further involved in the Middle East in military and intelligence operations, and he didn't think we were very good at it. Uh, and he thought, you know, if the history was that whenever we got involved, we just made things worse. Well, 
there's some uh, reason for him to have felt that way. On the other hand, uh, we paid a price. We paid a price, and the Syrians paid a price, and the Iraqis paid a price, and to some extent they are still paying a price uh, because there was a brief window when he might have done something about it. And right, the, the, one of the winners of the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize this year is a, a young woman, who, a Yazidi woman, uh, who uh, has warned the world about what ISIS did to her people. The, this, it's close to a genocide, and still nobody is doing much about it. Other, they give her the award, but uh, the UN hasn't even declared uh, the, the situation a, a genocide. Yeah, and the problem is that uh, the current problem, uh, we, we, we have Cassandra's now about this, because people are saying, you know, if you look at these cities that were ruined, leveled, large cities, two million people living in the city of Mosul, for example, uh, Rock, uh, Mosul, uh, these cities have been leveled, and there's a whole generation of people uh, living in refugee camps uh, who don't have homes, who don't have jobs, who don't have education. That is a recipe for uh, another wave of terrorist groups. Uh, these refugee camps are petri dishes uh, where new terrorism will grow up if you don't spend the money and the time to rebuild the societies. So if we defeat ISIS, and right now ISIS is on the run, uh, that ultimately doesn't solve the problem because uh, we'll just have other groups doing the same thing because they see the world differently? Well, they see the world differently, and they see it differently because, you know, in part they're living in these terrible conditions. Um, it's easy to tell somebody uh, who doesn't have a job or a prospect of one, who doesn't have any education or the prospect of getting any, who's living in a hovel in a refugee camp. Uh, it's easy to tell them that they have nothing to lose, uh, because, in fact, they probably don't have much to lose. It's easy to tell them that there's a, a way ahead, uh, and believe in Allah, believe in God, be willing to sacrifice your life. I think we'll see a resurgence of ISIS uh, or a new uh, terrorist group like it within the next 10 years. The way we have been dealing with it in this country is mostly through immigration policy, is that the right way to deal with this kind of thing? No. I mean, uh, the, the whole argument that uh, ISIS people were trying to come into the United States and therefore we had to ban people from Muslim countries, uh, it was nonsense. Uh, all those people already were going through serious vetting, extensive vetting before they were let in. We're only letting in a small number to begin with. And... If you look at all of the predominantly Muslim countries from which the president banned immigration, there had never been a terrorist from any of those countries come to the United States. There have been terrorists from other countries, but the ones he banned had never produced terrorists and it's that came to the United States. And it's interesting that uh, a number of the 9-11 terrorists were Saudis, and yet um, Saudi Arabia, uh, until just the other day, remained one of our best friends in the Middle East. Well, yeah, that's right. Um, well, and well, why aren't we paying more attention to Saudi Arabia? We should ban people coming from Saudi Arabia. Um, but he was willing to ban people coming from other countries that had never produced terrorists who came to the U.S. Now, I, I think his policy was not really about solving a problem, uh, as it was uh, whipping up uh, political fears uh, and political sentiment. A lot of what he does um, to solve problems, uh, when you look at what the problems are, they're not really problems. You know, it, it, he says, oh, we have to build a wall because of the massive numbers of people crossing the border. There aren't massive numbers of people crossing the border. And in fact, the, you know, the year of the campaign in 2016 when he was saying this, uh, the trend was actually the other way. Mexicans were returning uh, to Mexico more than they were coming in. Another possible impending disaster that you write about involves the Internet of Everything. Can you explain what your yeah, concerns are there? So right now, 
the, the number of devices connected to the Internet uh, is increasing at almost an exponential rate. Uh, it's not just computers and iPhones are connected. We're now connecting surveillance cameras, uh, uh, kitchen appliances, cars, all sorts of things, elevators. When people do this, uh, they don't build in the kind of security that we have on iPhones or laptops. Uh, now, iPhones and laptops aren't terribly secure, but they're a hell of a lot more secure uh, than all of these devices. And so people can and do hack into all of these devices uh, and take them over, and then they can use the computing power of these devices uh, to do other attacks. What's black energy? Uh, black energy is a, <clears throat> um, a piece of malware uh, that the Russians have developed uh, that can attack uh, machines on the power grid and get control of the power grid and essentially either turn the power grid off uh, or, even worse, destroy transformers and generators on the power grid. Have we seen it used? Yeah, they used it twice. Uh, against uh, Ukraine. Uh, they didn't use it to blow up things, but they did use it in two occasions to cause massive power blackouts. And there are stories of uh, them perhaps having uh, uh, hacked American energy uh, companies. Well, it's not stories. I mean, the head of U.S. intelligence, uh, Dan Coates, uh, said in June uh, that specifically that the Russians, the Russian government, had hacked its way into control systems uh, in the U.S. power grid. Uh, and it's remarkable when you think about it that nothing happened uh, in a big way as a result. Uh, there were no additional sanctions. The president didn't pick up the hotline and tell Putin to knock it off and get that stuff off our power grid. Um, there wasn't a massive U.S. government program to protect the power grid or to find the stuff and, and cleanse it off our power grid. It just kind of, that story, which in any normal world uh, would have been a continuing headline, uh, that story faded after a day. So are we waiting until the power fails before we... It sounds that way, doesn't it? Um, some people say, oh, well, so what if they're in the power grid? That doesn't matter. It only matters if they do something. Um, well, when they do something, it's kind of too late. You write about a man named Joe Weiss. Who's he? Joe is an expert on the power grid and uh, on the Internet of Things. And he has been saying precisely this for years, that the power grid is designed in a way that it is unsafe, that you can hack your way in, and you could take control remotely and turn it off or even destroy things on the power grid. And he was ridiculed for years. Uh, and then the Russians did exactly what he said, uh, and exactly in the way that he said it. Uh, and he's saying that that could happen here. Is he making new predictions? Well, he's, he's going around the country, speaking at conferences, he's speaking to regulators. Uh, whether or not he's getting through, I don't know. Well, we have seen uh, instances of cyber attacks and cyber warfare. Uh, uh, have any were any of them taken seriously before the, they became a problem? Well, yeah, I, I, I think the case of cyber, it's a mixed bag. Uh, a lot of people take it seriously. A lot of people are spending money um, trying to secure individual corporate networks or government networks. Um, it's very hard to do. Uh, there are some, you know, nationwide government level solutions that uh, might help. Um, but the government has been reluctant, even under Democrats, uh, to have federal government regulation uh, of industry uh, in order to produce cybersecurity. I'm speaking to Richard A. Clark, who, with R.P. Eddy, uh, wrote Warnings, Finding Cassandras to Stop Catastrophes. It's published now in a paperback uh, by Echo. This is WBAI, 99.5 FM in New York. I'm Leonard Lopate, and the show is... Uh, letter located at large. Some of the other reasons that you give for the rejection of the warnings of Cassandra's are scientific reticence 
Uh, what's that? Yeah, scientific reticence is, is interesting, where one scientist uh, says, look, I've run this study, and, and here are the results. Um, and he puts it out for, or she puts it out for peer review. Uh, and the the other scientists say, well, yeah, you know, that could be true, but we have to replicate that study, um, you know, five times. Um, and Jim Hansen's a case in point where Jim says, well, you know, my analysis will never be proven true until there is sea level rise that floods Manhattan. And, you know, I can't replicate that. I can't melt Greenland five times for you to see if it works every time. And if you wait uh, to find out, you've waited too long. Well, isn't there an island in the Pacific that is already disappearing? Isn't that enough proof? Oh, it, I think it's generally accepted that there is sea level rise. What is not generally accepted is the rate at which it is rising uh, or how, what, the, what the ultimate potential of sea level rise is. Uh, but there are these cases where if you go purely by the full scientific method uh, of uh, you know, peer review, trial and error, replicated study, uh, you can't do that in time to get ready for some of these events. So we, we have to wait until uh, Rockaway and parts of Brooklyn and Manhattan and Staten Island disappear before we say, oh, there, we have five examples right here in New York. Right. Well, now we have proof. In fact, if, if you fill the air with CO2, uh, the glaciers will melt and the water will rise. I mean, you can do, it seems to me you can do that in a computer simulation a hundred times. You don't have to do it in the real world, right? Another reason you give is something you call satisficing. Yeah, satisficing is this um, approach that we talked about where you, where you do some hedging. Uh, so you, you realize that if, as a decision maker, you do nothing, uh, that you will be subject to criticism. Uh, and you're always going to have the Joe Weisses or the Jim Hansons or whoever the Cassanders are uh, biting at your ankle. Uh, and so to shut them up uh, and also to cover your rear end in case something actually does happen, uh, you do a little so you address uh, the issue, but enough, don't solve you know the problem. It's not enough, but you can say that you've done something. Uh -huh. Addressing the issue, but not solving the problem, really. Exactly. Not solving the underlying problem uh, and not really getting ready for the disaster, either. I've heard that you and R.P. Eddy, uh, your co-author, said that you feel as though there is a real pattern in most catastrophes, whether they're natural or man-made. What kind of pattern? Well, there's a pattern, um, first of all, of people predicting it in advance. There's a pattern of people being ignored. Uh, there's a pattern when it happens uh, of no one ever going back and saying, oh, you were right, we should have listened to you. Uh, that's a consistent arc. In the case of Cassandra, she came to a rather sad end. Yeah, well, well in, in the, in the myth. myth, you know, in the, the Cassandra myth, uh, Part of her, uh, she was hexed uh, by the gods. Uh, and they had put a curse on her. Apollo and was part in... of the curse was that she would see the future accurately and be able to see disasters accurately. Um, but part of the curse was that no one would ever listen to her and that she would grow anxious because of that and go mad. Uh, and frankly, many of the Cassandras we looked at in the book, while they never went mad, um, they certainly got anxious. Uh, Jim Hansen got so anxious he protested, chained himself to the White House fence, and got arrested. Uh, and part of this is a feedback loop where the Cassandra loses credibility uh, because they're out there yelling and screaming, uh, and the more they are out there yelling and screaming, the less they're believed. Your book received a lot of attention when it was published in hardcover last year, although uh, we're talking to you today because... The situation really hasn't changed all that much, but are you hopeful that the book's message has been heard by at least some people in power? Well, we're beginning to have people talk to us about uh, the Cassandra effect, and we've institutionalized it in a way by giving out an annual award. Um, we uh, have a website, um, 
where we asked for people to nominate current day Cassandras, uh, and then we pick, uh, we will pick once a year uh, a Cassandra to receive an award and help focus some press attention uh, on that person. Last year, the first one uh, was a professor from Rutgers uh, who predicted that even a small nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula or between India and Pakistan could, pre- could produce the phenomenon known as global warming, which would cause massive uh, drought and famine in the world for two or three years. We still have people in our government and other governments talking about the possible use of nuclear weapons. Oh, in fact, uh, when they, uh, uh, this administration was rewriting the nuclear doctrine, uh, in one of their drafts they said that nuclear weapons uh, could be used to respond to a massive cyber attack. Uh, so the Trump administration was actually contemplating uh, lowering the nuclear threshold and making it easier to justify nuclear war. You were in the White House Security Council. Uh, In looking at what's going on today, do you see similar things happening, or do you feel the situation has improved or worsened? Well, I I think in a way the the Trump administration is a Cassandra event. Um, We had the the British expert uh, Michael Steele, uh, British intelligence officer who had a lot of data, who said that Putin was trying to put uh, Trump into office uh, to weaken the United States. Uh, and um, that appears to be true, uh, certainly true that Putin was trying to put him into office. And it does appear that he is now weakening the United States, sowing division internally uh, and then externally. Uh, insulting our allies and breaking up our alliances. Uh, If he's not doing it uh, because Putin wants him to, it's a heck of a coincidence because he's doing everything that uh, Putin's strategy uh, would call for. Talking about Britain, there were any number of Cassandras in Britain who predicted that Brexit would be a real problem, and now Britain is forced to deal with that, and it looks like an, an insoluble situation. Well, it looks like one that's that's going to weaken uh, both Britain uh, and the EU, and that's another case where um, Putin's people manipulated. I won't say they were, you know, determinative, uh, but they certainly manipulated the situation uh, to drive toward uh, division and dissent in the country and uh, drive for uh, for Brexit. Uh, drive to take Britain out of the EU. That's what Russia wanted. Uh, And they wanted it because it weakens the EU and it weakens Britain. Richard A. Clark is co-author with R.P. Eddy of Warnings, Finding Cassandras to Stop Catastrophes, published in paperback now by Echo. And that brings us to the end of our show. My great thanks to Richard Clark. To Todd McGovern, who produced today's segment, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, and to my assistant producer, Jesse Lent, who is at the audio controls today. Uh, Low Paid and Large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Low Paid at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week.